It's time to accelerate. Hey, friends, this is Andy. Welcome to episode 668 of Accelerate, sales podcast of record. I've got two great conversations lined up for you today. First, join me is Kevin Freiberg. Kevin is co-author with his wife, Jackie, of a new book titled Bochi Ball, The Chemistry of Winning and Losing in Baseball, Business, and Life. I'm talking about the leadership lessons that they learned from uh, their talks with Bruce Bochi, manager of the San Francisco Giants. And then following my talk with Kevin is another in my series of weekly conversations with my good friend, Bridget Gleason. Today's show is brought to you in part by our friends at Discover.org. The Discover.org platform is a game changer for sales and marketing professionals. This feature-rich sales intelligence platform is supported by more than 250 researchers who continually update the contact data, provide account-specific insights to help sales and marketing teams break ahead of the pack. See the product live at discoverorg.com forward slash schedule hyphen demo. All right, joining me on the first segment of Accelerate this week is, as I mentioned, Kevin Freiberg, uh, who, along with his wife, Jackie, has published a new book titled Bochi Ball, The Chemistry of Winning and Losing in Baseball, Business, and Life. Uh, they're also the authors of some of several other high-profile business biographies, including one on Herb Kelleher, uh, former chairman of Southwest Airlines. And today we're going to talk about the leadership lessons we can learn from the way that Bruce Bochi has managed the Giants, the San Francisco Giants to three world championships, world series championships in, in pretty short order after he took over the team. Uh, some of the things to talk about is you know, how to give people freedom within structure, your employees free within structure, freedom to succeed. Um, how to hire, why you need to hire people with entrepreneurial spirit. And it's really interesting to think about this in terms of bringing people onto a, a team sport with entrepreneurial spirit, but interesting talk there. And then also interesting learning how to balance between trusting data and going with your gut. You know, this is a really relevant topic for today as we all have more data uh, available to us to analyze what we're doing. But again, what's the balance we should achieve between going with the data or less at trusting our gut instinct? So you want to check that out. So here we go. Kevin Freiberg, welcome to the show. Hey, good to be with you, Andy. Thank you. Well, always great to welcome a fellow San Diegan. We sh- well, actually, we probably should have done this in person. <laughs> yeah, we sit next to each other, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. I can probably, over the water, right? I can, I can almost see your house from here. <laughs> so, uh, for people who don't know, he didn't listen to my introduction, as Kevin is a co-author with his wife, Jackie, of the book, Bochi Ball, The Chemistry of Winning and Losing in Baseball, Business, and Life, and certainly not the first book that you two have written together. No, this is number eight, but I'll tell you what, uh, Andy, it doesn't get any easier. You know, you just uh, you keep working at it. You keep trying to refine it, but we're really proud of this one. It's, uh, it was a labor of love. So why, why Bochi? You know, uh, we met Bruce 21 years ago uh, through a mutual friend. Bruce came uh, up to manage the San Diego Padres. And in typical Bruce Bochy fashion, realized that uh, he knew a lot about baseball, but he didn't know a lot about communicating with the media, wanted some help with that, connected with us. And uh, after about a year to a year and a half of working with him, Jackie and I looked at each other and said, this guy's as, as good as any CEO we've, we've ever written about, including Herb Kelleher. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's a book here. Uh, and I said that before he ever left the Padres and went and won three World Series right. in San Francisco, but it took us a while to get there. <laughs> well, so let me let me ask the question: Is why are we sort of as a society? Why are we so fascinated by you know head coaches of sports teams? I mean, we we uh, yeah, we tend to mythologize them to a, to a large extent and maybe attribute things to them that maybe powers them that perhaps don't exist, but and I ask this as a fan because I'm a, a huge Vince Lombardi fan. I'm a huge Steve Kerr fan. Sure. And I died. So, um, so I have to admit though I'm a little conflicted about it because you know sometimes I wonder whether we give them too much credit or too little credit, perhaps for for achieving. So, what is it about that that position that resonates so much with people? I don't know if I have a great answer for it, Andy, but I but I share your uh, confliction, if you will. <laughs> You know, Jack Welch told me a long time ago when we were doing the research for our first book, he said, as CEOs, we get a hell of a lot more 
credit than we deserve, and we get a lot more criticism than we deserve too. And I think that's probably true of of, of head coaches. Uh, you know uh, why I share your your conflict over this, and then I'll try to answer your question. Sure. I, you know, I, I think um, when I was in a doctoral program, Jackie and I we we studied this theory called the great man theory, right? And there's the the great man, typically CEO at the head of an organization. And we look at the, you know, pick your name, Steve Jobs today, Mm -hmm. Elon Musk, uh, back in the day, it could be Jack Welch or any of that, Herb Keller. And we tend to think, well, wow, these guys are the guys that did it and created it all. And yet, if you really ask them and you really get under the hood, you realize It's always a team effort. It's always a collaboration. They've surrounded themselves in many cases with people who are as smart or smarter than they are. But there is this propensity, I think, to have a focal point. And I don't know if it's because we all want it easy and we say, gosh, if I could just be like Andy, if I could sell like Andy, or if I could run an airline like Herb Kelleher, we got it. Well, guess what? Life is more complex than that. Business is more complex than that. But I think the media, um, you know, I don't want to get into media bashing, but I think the media does a disservice because they like to make it sound simpler than it really is. Yeah, no, well, it's funny that you it, you bring up this idea of this, this team effort, and obviously in sports, sports is a team effort, but but it seems like we're over the, because of some of the media over the last 10, 15, 20 years, that, that we, um, we see more... CEOs certainly, I think more even than sports coaches, sort of take the credit for 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 the success, right? And certainly, you look at the you know the paychecks of the CEOs have gone up astronomically in the last twenty years uh, compared to what they were previously, and for not more significant returns by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and so they're getting you know rewarded for work they really don't do, and they seem to be taking credit for it. And I think that's one thing at least you see in. Sp- you don't see as much as in sports. I think maybe you see it tend more in the college level, perhaps than the professional level, at least on football. Is that, yeah, coaches seem to be still acknowledge that it's a team sport. It's a it's a system. It's a process, and and that that's what's more important than just one individual. I think that's true. I don't know. You know, I'm conflicted about that too because I'm with you on the same. On the one hand, there's there's a lot of uh, you know very highly paid senior executives and CEOs that maybe aren't getting the return on investment for their companies that is commensurate with, you know, what they, what they make in stock options and and salary. At the same time, I'm, I'm conflicted because uh, I think it's harder. You know, everybody today is getting better. Competition is global. It's tougher. Everyone and everything around you is getting better. Technology waits for no one. And so, uh, I think there's a lot of pressure on that role as well, you know, the CEO role in terms of responding to a board. And um, I could even extrapolate that into into baseball. You know, baseball is notorious for, look, if you're not getting the numbers, we're going to, you know, we're going to change out the, 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 the coaching staff, you know. And, and in some cases, it's absolutely ridiculous because right. you, you say, wait a minute, <laughs> uh, you're really going to put that on the coaching staff when you probably didn't do a good job of recruiting players, or maybe your farm system sucks right now and you haven't built that up and brought people in, but you're going to, but somebody has got to be the scapegoat. So I'm, I'm sort of conflicted with you in the, in the CEO world of, yeah, they make a lot of money, but they have a lot of pressure too. Yeah. Well, I think what, one of the things that's, that certainly is, seems to be the case with, you know, the pro sports head coach, the manager in baseball, is that um, yeah? It's really hard for the underdog to succeed, right? There are very few instances these days, and this is why it's sort of interesting. Even looking at Bochy's cases, that you know his his continued successes in San Francisco have been tied to San Francisco's pretty dramatic increase in their payroll from year to year. You know, over the course of his tenure there, from sort of being a middle of the pack payroll when he first got there to I think the number two this year in payroll in Major League Baseball. Which obviously creates more pressures on him for for succeeding and so on, but but it oftentimes seems to be that you know success follows cash, and that's get back to this issue about how how influential coaches are in that, which I think they are, regardless of the payroll. But but it's also it's hard to succeed as Bochy showed in San Diego if you're not given the tools, 
I mean, there's very few instances we have these days in sports and maybe, again, professional soccer. Example, a few years ago in the English Premier League where Leicester City won the Premier League. You know, they're bottom half, usually bottom half of the table. Uh, team, very limited resources, but they had that magic year, right? But that's... It seemed like we had more magic years when, you know, 10, 20, or not, maybe 20, 30 years ago than we see now. Yeah, I think you're, I think you're right, uh, Andy, to, to an extent. A um, couple comments about that. One, I, I think it depends on how you define success, too, right? Mm-hmm. You know, in baseball, you know, success is a world championship. And yet, I would tell you that Bruce uh, is, is the most successful manager the San Diego Padres ever had in terms of getting more out of less. Right. A role that he had, right? Right. Um, Took him to a World Series in 1998, several uh, division championships. But I think if you looked at the people who are way smarter about business, uh, baseball than I am, would tell you uh, he did a really great job of coaching players to a higher potential with little payroll <clears throat> than than anybody that's been with the with the Padres. And then the reverse of that is. And by the way, I agree with you. Money uh, championships do tend to follow, but. That's not necessarily the case with the uh, with the Los Angeles Dodgers now, is it? True. True. I mean, they're more consistently competitive, but right, they're not. Uh, no, they, I mean, they may break through and they, they'll get it done eventually. But yeah. I mean, talk about a deep pockets, high payroll, and yet they haven't been able to put it put one over the top. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's absolutely true. I said that's why I think the coach does have influence. I mean, you look at. Well, you look at the Patriots, and I've written about Belichick and his system. You know, he he doesn't have, other than Brady, there's really not a superstar on the team. It doesn't mean he doesn't have a bunch of well-paid athletes, but I don't know where they stand in terms of overall payroll. But here's a, a, a football CEO, if you will, not CEO of the whole organization, but of the, the playing part of it, the product part, that clearly has an influence uh, that clearly has a system, a well-defined system, and this is, I think, really a lesson for CEOs and for sales leaders and so on, is is having a process, having a system. It doesn't necessarily mean everybody has to be unique, but I think one of the things that Belichick does that that is so influential, and they really talked about this last year with the Patriots uh, leading up to playing the Eagles in the Super Bowl, is he does such an incredible job of defining what it is people's responsibilities are and what the expectations are. And by removing that ambiguity, you really free people up to perform at the top level. I think you're absolutely 100% right. And I see that, I've seen that in Bruce over 20 years too. You know, he, he begins every spring training going back to the fundamentals, talking about role, responsibility, and accountability. And it, and it gets back to what you just said. If you know your role, if you know where you're supposed to be, if you know what makes up that role and how you're to execute it, then there's a whole lot of freedom and, quite frankly, creativity because no game unfolds the way you think it's going to unfold. Mm -hmm. A whole lot of creativity that can be executed within that role, but it starts with a a role. I said to Bruce many years ago because he was always talking about role responsibility and fundamentals and, and working the system, and I said, well, these guys are major league ball players. Don't they kind of have the fundamentals down at this point? I mean, duh. <laughs> he said, you know what? When you're in the postseason and you're in the opponent's house and you got 40,000 fans screaming and, and they're on you and the pressure's on and you got to make a play, those fundamentals have to be second nature. That role responsibility has to be ingrained in you uh, so you can be creative. So I think you're absolutely right about that. Yeah, well, Vince Lombardi talked about that. I mean, people always, if they don't know much about Lombardi and they learn just a little, they tend to think he was sort of this authoritarian figure, which he, discipline was hugely important to him. And, you know, everybody talks about Lombardi time. You know, if he didn't show up to the bus 10 minutes before it was due to take off, the bus took off. Um, but he believed, he talked about, you know, the, the power of freedom within structure. And... We seem to be losing that in the business side. I see this in sales all the time is, is partly through the use of our technologies that we have now that provide greater transparency, sort of the processes. We get these data points and these metrics and we manage people to the metrics instead of saying, look, this is, this is what you 
let's be unambiguously clear about what your job is and train them in the fundamentals so that, yeah, when they get in a situation, the thing about sales, this is just like any other pursuit. The only thing you can guarantee about a sales situation, it's never going to go as planned. Yeah, right, right. So, you know, so you need to be able to, to be flexible and creative within that structure that you have. And if it's, you know, you're in a process that's too rigidly laid out, this is where I think coaches fail. And I think it's where, where um, you know, people in, in business fail. Yeah, I think you're. I think that's right, and I think it's the, the a really well honed system gives you the freedom to to be creative. And then I, I think the other side of that equation, if if discipline, accountability, and a well honed system is one side, I think then within that system, uh, you really have to be flexible and spontaneous enough to to create a culture where you read your people. You know, one thing Bruce has always lived out. Uh, with the Giants and with the Padres is one size doesn't fit all. One size fits one. Mm -hmm. The way you manage uh, a Pablo Sandoval, who was his third baseman for a long time, Mm -hmm. uh, a a superstar phenom like Buster Posey are way different. Buster Posey's all business. You need to tell him once. He gets it. He's focused. Pablo you know, they just kind of <laughs> push push them away from the table to start with. <laughs> keep moving right on by the kitchen, you know. <laughs> uh, and yet, he's this he's this kid that just exudes a love for the game and a mm. passion for the game. I don't know if you've been following the, the Giants at all, but you know, we're not even halfway through the season. He came back as a as a uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, they're low man on the totem pole in mm-hmm. terms of just they just brought him in basically for backup, but he has so far pitched a game, pitched an inning. He's played first base, he's played shortstop, and he's played third base. And he's done a pretty doggone good job in all three of those places. So there's a kid that just loves the game. But my point is Bruce manages those players within the system very differently. You gotta read your people. Well, let me ask you a question. This is then it sort of occurred to me as I was going through the book is would you have written the book if he hadn't moved to San Francisco? Uh, Andy, that's a really fair question. And I, uh, I'm going to give you a really crystal clear answer. Yes. And no, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the yes part of that is I thought you know, when you see leadership potential, and I'm sure in your travels around the world and, and your work with clients, you know, you get you meet a handful of people every year where you just go, man, mm-hmm. this woman, this guy gets it. They get sales, they get leadership, they get sales uh, management, they get it. Uh, I think we really felt strongly about that in the last number of years, having watched him for 12 manage the Padres. So in that sense, yes, we would have written a book. Now, with my sales hat on, you're all, you know, if you're going to spend a year or two writing a book and turning blank computer screens into chapters, which is a real pain in the ass, uh, it better have some marketability. And it certainly had more marketability with their three world <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's, that's partly I wonder, but also I was sort of wondering, and you, you know, tell folks, so, yeah, one of the problems that, that exists uniformly in business, and we'll include sports as a business in this, is that you know, you see people being hired into roles that yeah, you know, quite honestly in baseball, long time problem of hiring retreads, right? People had never never been successful managers, but had been managers for extended periods of time. So they obviously knew how to handle the job and so on. But you know, in terms of external measures of success, uh, one loss record, championships, pennants, so on, they didn't have any. And we see this in business all the time, too. Is you know, people once they become a CEO, it's like they seems like they find another CEO job somewhere. Or once you become a sales manager or a sales leader, you find something. Even if you never really have these, you know, obvious successes to it. So when the Giants were looking at at Bochi at the time, you know, as a replacement, and and they'd had. Two managers, probably you know, Dusty Baker had been successful. They'd had, I guess, one pennant they'd won under Dusty, but uh, you know, his his record, Dusty's record at the Giants, 
you know, as, as a win loss percentage is better than Boach's. But uh, you know, he didn't have three world titles to his to his name either. So so what was it about Bochi when the Giants were making that that sort of said, yeah, this is the guy that's gonna be our leader that's gonna take us to that that next level uh, on a consistent basis. You know, I asked Brian Sabian, their uh, former GM and now their uh, executive vice president of baseball operations, that very same question. And Brian said something that I thought was pretty, pretty unique. He said, when Boach came to San Francisco, we needed each other. We were in a rebuilding Mm -hmm. mode. Think about it. They had uh, Barry Bonds, but you can't build a team around one superstar. They proved that. Right. And it was very exciting to watch Bonds hit one after another out of the park. But you can't win championships with, with a single superstar. And so they were very much in a rebuilding mode. And Brian said, you know, when we sat down with our owners over dinner and a get-to-know-you kind of conversation with Boach, it became very clear to us that he was still had the fire in the belly to win. Mm-hmm. He said, I want to go to a place that wants to win as badly as I do. And Boach has told me that he saw that fire in Brian's eyes as well. So I think what the the chemistry, no pun intended here, but that drew them together was uh, this pretty long, in-depth experience. Brian Sabian had had, uh, recruited and scouted for the New York Yankees, well-tenured GM, Mm -hmm had 12 years in management and done a lot with the little in San Diego plus 20 some years as a catcher in baseball. And I think all that experience combined with the passion is the why Bochi, why they wanted him. They saw the fire in the belly. So what's the lesson then for CEOs who are hiring, you know, significant for significant leadership roles within their organization? What's, what's the key takeaways for them? Well, I don't want to be tried about this, but I think one of the key takeaways is, yes, you, you want experience and, and maybe experience that that shows there's greater potential than maybe what's been demonstrated. But I think you also want to, you know, hire for, for attitude and for passion. Uh, the San Francisco Giants, I don't know if you know much about their history, but yeah. they were, they were uh, on the scrap heap in 1992. Mm-hmm. They, Amistad Park was a terrible place to watch baseball. They they sucked as a team. Uh, they were being sold for pennies on the dollar to a Tampa Bay investor, and Major League Baseball held it up. Long story short, uh, Larry Bear and Peter McGowan, who was the CEO for Safeway, Safeway right? and others, uh, really put their fannies on the line and financed, uh, if it wasn't the first, it was one of the first privately financed ballparks in the country. Mm-hmm. My point in sharing that with you is there is an entrepreneurial spirit that runs through the Giants organization. And while they are flamboyant in marketing, they're pretty humble from a cultural point of view and from a fiscal point of view. So when they hired Boach, I think they were also asking the question, is this guy a fit for the culture that we're that we're we've had and we are we're trying to grow. And of course he was an incredible fit, right? Because they were creating the fertile ground for him to come into, but he also helped shape that culture and extended it from you know what the what the founders or really the guys who saved it um, uh, brought into the to the year two thousand. Yeah, and I think that right. And I th- I think that part of that from my reading of it and is and just other examples in business and life and and is that you know, when you're hiring these critical roles it's really important that you find somebody who stands for something right and and I think that's something that where leaders oftentimes fail when they're hiring people is is they're not hiring people that have a point of view and something that that you know is intellectually well thought out that that you know has a rationale to it that yeah may not work in every circumstance, but in the right circumstances is going to blossom and bloom. And, and you know Steve Kerr is again it's a perfect example of that. Is is yeah I love his sort of four cornerstones. You know what he his theory: you know, mindfulness, compassion, competition, and joy. Right? When was yeah. the last time you heard somebody talk about joy in the workplace? I, mean, I, I to me that's maybe the more powerful of the four four attributes, but. 
But here's a guy that didn't have head coaching experience, and yet, yeah, on the basis of, of really those values, obviously they've been a success. Yeah, well, I'm with you. I love him. I think he's a, a, you know, he's just fun to watch coach. And I don't know if you watched the game last night and last few games. But I did, yeah. They are just a fun team to watch. And they can be down and you don't count them out. They could be down 15 points in the fourth quarter and you just don't. There's a, there's a passion. There's a resilience. There's something going on there. And I think joy uh, – you know, I liken Steph Curry to, to a Pablo Sandoval. Both those guys, you watch them play, they just play with joy. Mm-hmm. And I, I think uh, I read something this morning that, uh, you know, Curry didn't have a great game last night. No. And uh, One of ten from a three-point line, yeah. The article said that Curry said, I just wanted to make one, one three-pointer. Well, he made the critical three-pointer. Yes, he did. Right. And uh, it was Kevin Durant or somebody was talking about him and said he just plays with so much joy that, you know, some guys would go, well, I've sucked tonight. You know, I've, I've missed all these three pointers. I'm de-. He's still going, I just want one, baby. Just give me one at the right time. That's joy, man. That's 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 aliveness. And uh, obviously, Kerr has done something to draw that out of those teams. Well, no, that's a critical point is, is some of that's innate to the player, but a lot of that is creating that culture. And this is what I see missing oftentimes in sales when I work with organizations is that, you know, when you are so intent on just measuring your people on sort of this you know, minute basis of their activities in a moment in moment, instead of enabling them and empowering them to utilize their skills, their capabilities to the best of their abilities, give them that freedom where they do experience that joy. I mean, for me, over the years, I've four decades in sales and I've you know, I start off selling women's shoes at JC Penney's, but you know, I end up selling, you know, large communication systems systems worth millions of dollars. It was just fun, right? It was just flat out fun when you're doing it. If you didn't, and I just, I always wanted to hire people that that I thought similarly would experience that fun in the moment that that had that that streak, sort of an independent streak, even that didn't want to be so tightly managed, but wanted to go. Just go have fun and, and you know land deals, and I think you know the same thing is true with with Curry. I think it's true with teams I see in sports that succeed, or teams I see in business that succeed. The ones that are succeeding the most are having fun, and the fun precedes the success. You know, I, I you and I are on the same page on that. When we when we first got to know Herb Kelleher, gosh, uh, thirty years ago now, mm-hmm. um, Jackie and I were on a mission. And the mission was because we were just blown away. We'd written a couple doctoral dissertations on Southwest Airlines and got to know them. And they just became such a beacon on a hill to say you can actually talk about love, because Herb does, yep. joy and fun, and run a successful airline. And Andy, let me tell you something. If you're going to run one of the best on-time performance airlines and and have 45 years of consecutive profitability, you can't do that without discipline and accountability and systems built into your organization. But that doesn't mean within all of that you can't have fun, talk about loving your people. And Herb does. You know, he says, you know, I'd rather have a company bound by love than a company bound by fear. Well, that makes a lot of sense to me. I'd rather have a marriage bound by love than a marriage bound by fear. I'd rather have kids bound right. by love than bound right. by fear. Right? Right. Yeah. But why have we made that such a taboo to talk about in business? And I'll tell you why. It's because most senior executives aren't very comfortable with it. You can't measure it. What do you do with it? People are complex. And it requires a hell of a lot of emotional labor to start talking like that. Well, and the, but the fact is, people are complex, and this is this is something that just drives me nuts. Uh, when yeah, you know, I'm talking to a sales manager, and again, they just want to default to the the metrics and the numbers. It's like you're talking about it in sales. You're talking about something that happens, a transaction where you get two complex human beings talking to each other. You can't predict what's going to happen, right? So, you know, so you so you have to you have to enable people to be. Flexible and adaptable and creative, as we talked all the things we talked about before. Have compassion. Have you know, at sales, you want to have compassion for the people you're selling to. You have empathy for them. 
but you're also competing for the business. That is a competitive world. So you got to enjoy the competition aspect of it as well. Um, and then have fun, right? You know, I was going to say, because you've talked about, you know, managing by sales quotas and statistics and all the metrics. If there is if there is a metric-driven sport in the world today, it baseball. has to be professional baseball, right? right? They got a metric for everything. And in fact, they call it saber metrics. Right. And one of the things that uh, Boach and I've had many, many conversations about, and, and they've always downplayed this. The Giants have had one of the most sophisticated analytical uh, departments mm-hmm. in Major League Baseball. But I think this is really smart. They downplay it. And the reason they downplay it, they use the statistics, but Bruce has always said it's a balance. He calls them the propeller heads that you know are up there running the spreadsheets and everything. He says the propeller heads aren't going to tell you that a Travis Ishikawa is absolutely been sitting on the bench and hungry to get in and make a game-winning home run. You know, mm-hmm. they're not going to tell you that. They're going to tell you, no, you don't play him. You play these other guys, right? And so Bruce has always said it's got to be a both and. But baseball is clearly moving to the where you're talking about, which is a lot of the GMs today are uh, puppets might be too strong a term, but they really are carrying their order takers who are carrying out the wishes of the analytics team. Mm-hmm. The challenge with that is um, it's changing the game. It, it's changing the game radically, right? right. And, and I think in some cases for the better. I mean, data is good if you leverage it right. But data doesn't – data isn't God. Data doesn't tell you – you know, when I, I – look, you're the expert. I'm not. But I got to think. You're in a critical sales call. Maybe this is the fourth or fifth time you've met with this person. And the metrics would tell you go left. But your gut, your heart, and everything you've read about this person is saying – I think you ought to go right. There's one more thing you ought to probe, one more pain point you ought to unpack and get to. Metrics can't do that for you. Exactly. Exactly. And it, it's funny. It's, is people interpret metrics as knowing more, right? It's, it's, you know, we've got all this data. We know more. But then I always look at it, and, and I had the pleasure uh, just recently of, of interviewing Harvey McKay, who wrote, yeah. you know, Swimming yeah. with the Sharks and so on. And and I'd read his Swimming with the Sharks relatively early in my career. And and this idea of his 66-question list that, that he has his salespeople fill out and learn over the course of time, learn about the prospect. It's learning, going in-depth about understanding the person you're going to be potentially doing business with. That's data. It's not numeric data. But that's going deep. That is knowing. And that's the part we're, we're not doing today, right? We're doing this, what I call the superficial data that you can sort of average and generalize. And I think this is happening in baseball too. But to Boach's point and to Harvey McKay's, it's like, no, you got to, you know, to really make a form of judgment that's informed is, as I said, he had his salespeople fill out a 66 question questionnaire about every, every prospect. They really, they really knew that because then they had more information to make a judgment about it. Right, absolutely, and, and I'm I, I'm just speaking as a customer at this point or a client. You know, I'd, I'd much rather be served than sold. Mm-hmm. I want to be understood. I'm a I'm a hick that grew up in South Dakota, transferred to the to the West Coast, but I want to be known. Yeah, I want to I want to be known. And if you're going to do business with me on any level, whether you're my self, well, let's not even talk about self providers, but you know. <laughs> Whoever you are, um, I, I want you to know my pain points and my pressure points. And you can't just do that with data. You know, I, I, I remember um, one of the executives at Harley Davidson telling me, uh, I grew up in Rapid City, South mm-hmm. Dakota. 30 minutes from Rapid is the largest motorcycle yep, around. Every year. Yep. Sturgis, right? Sturgis, right. The guys at Harley were saying, you know, you can bring people in for a focus group and say, what do you think about this new whiz-bang bike that we're, we're prototyping here? He said, but that's a whole lot different sales experience than if you fly out to Sturgis and you hang out for three weeks and you got 10 guys sitting around a fabricated bike that somebody's just modified and you're looking at the oohs and the ahs and the questions that they ask and the intensity and the interest 
He said, that'll tell you way more about your product and customer's response to that product than any focus group is ever going to tell you. And I thought, that's data, mm -hmm. but it's qualitative data. Exactly. So Yeah, I, we tend to default to the quantitative these days. And in baseball, certainly, and Buster Olney on ESPN wrote a long article a couple weeks ago decrying the changes to the game caused by sort of the what he thinks is over reliance on metrics. Um, I don't know. I, I, I think I'd, I'd vote in favor of, of more use of metrics that have made the game shorter. <laughs> that, would, that would be good. That need to be shortened, that's for sure. Still, you know, you said something earlier that I just wanted to go back to because I thought it was an important point we didn't talk about. You said you were talking about having a point of view. Mm -hmm. you know, have a point of view. And, and um, what I read into that, if I read it right, was when CEOs are looking for, you know, whoever the next person to add to their team is, I, I think having that point of view is critical. And I think also being uh, what Jackie and I call cause, cause driven, you know, Bruce is always, which is really pretty odd for a, a major league baseball manager, but he's always challenged his players to play for something bigger than themselves. Mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're in a performance driven sport, right? you've got to be conscious of your numbers because your numbers determine whether you're going to get re-upped or not, you know, right. whether the next big uh, negotiation is going to go well, whether they're going to keep you on. So players are very numbers conscious, but he said, you know, if, if they become so conscious about their performance and the metrics, then they play tight. They don't play loose. And in addition to that, it's just not the right thing. He says, you know, how's this for, I mean, I think this is pretty passionate. He said, we got people in the stands that just came home from Afghanistan and they just need a little slice of America today mm. You're for them. We got a kid who's coming and has never attended a major league baseball game. And he's coming with his dad for the first time. That's who you're playing for. We've got a family who couldn't afford a vacation this year, but they could afford to bring everybody to the ballpark and spend 500 bucks on beer and food and tickets. That's who you're playing for. Play for a cause bigger than your numbers. And I think that's genius. Well, and true, absolutely true in sales as well. I mean, if you're, I've never hired someone who said they're in it for the money. Yeah, if they're in it to help a customer, if they're in it to serve other people, if they've got some you know, larger purpose in life that perhaps ties into it, those are people that are going to succeed. I mean, of course, you're always going to have exceptions. People that are purely self interested, <laughs> some of those do break through and succeed, but that's not how you build a team. And, you know, when you're recruiting a salesperson or recruiting a baseball player, you're not recruiting a player or a salesperson. You're recruiting a member of a team. And you need to really keep that in mind. Yeah. Well, and I think I got to think in sales when, when times get tough, right? Because they do. I mean, you don't ride a trajectory that just goes like this forever. No. What is it that fuels the fires of perseverance and, and stick to itiveness when you're, when you're having a tough year or a tough month or whatever? I got to think it ain't. It ain't the money. It's got to be the passion for the cause and something larger than what, you know, what the money brings. The oh, money absolutely, brings. absolutely. I I just uh, have published a little ebook, and it's about hey, if you're a sales manager and your sales are slowing down, you know, what do you do, right? Because it is. You know, it's never a straight line. It's always something. But you have pressures. You've you know, like every profession, you have pressures to, pressures to perform. Excuse me. But the number one thing that I recommend that I've seen successful is when you hit that is go out and talk to your customers, right? Talk to the people that you're serving and you're going to find the answers to your problems there first and foremost before you do anything else. Get reconnected. And that's you know true in a sport as well as you want to, you know, you want to just, you know, maybe blame if something's going wrong and blame it on the players or something. But no, look at the... Look at the team, right? What are you What are you playing for? And uh, if you get that reconnection going, then teams tend to get back on a good footing. And I think sometimes you got to back away from. I, I don't know what you've experienced in all the the probably hundreds of thousands of people you've coached in sales, but I got to think. You know, when you're having tough times, the tendency is to get down and grind harder, right? And do the same thing and just do it a little bit better, do it a little bit harder and grind. And I've watched Bruce. You know, I. <laughs> 2017 was not a pretty year for the Giants. Right. Three 
championships and then they had the worst year in franchise history and we had many believe me painful conversations about what do you do what what do you do when you're and sometimes you know he will say you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna play people in different roles that they're not even accustomed to playing i'm just gonna shake it up and and get them to have fun and try to shake this this funk out of the clubhouse but uh the point being that, you know, sometimes just grinding more and, you know, working harder and doing more of the same thing is not the answer. Oftentimes not. Yeah. <laughs> if you're not, if you're doing the work in the first place, right. If you're not doing the work, then yeah, maybe you need to do more, but right. But if you're doing the work and in his case, you know, largely a, you know, a consistent roster, somewhat with when they were champions, you know, they haven't gone down that hill or downhill that much. I mean, it's, yeah. Something, some things at work, and shaking it up oftentimes is a good way to to sort of step back and say, yeah, let's start injecting the fun, the camaraderie back into the sport. Certainly in true in sales, when you're in a dip, is is yeah, give yourself a break. That's sometimes a good time to go, you know, do a day at the beach as a team, or you know, golf outing or something. Is that just get out of the get off yourself for a second and um, have a different perspective. Yeah, I like that. I like what you just said. Get out of yourself for, for a second. You know, Bruce has always said, look, at the end of the day, it's a game. It's a business for sure. And it's, sure. A, it's a sophisticated business and it's it's a big business. But at the end of the day, it's a game. We're not talking about, you know, walking through landmines in, in Afghanistan. It's or, yeah, or brain surgery on somebody. I mean, it's, yeah, the, and that's true in most cases in sales. I mean, the, the stakes are pretty low. In the in the real sense, right? So, yeah, you can take it too seriously, and that that can be to your detriment. Yeah, I think that's true. All right, well, Kevin, we've run out of time, but uh, it's been a great conversation. Thank you very much, Andy. Thank you. I've enjoyed it very much. So, tell people how they can find out more about your book. Well, the best way to do it is to just to go to bochiball.com. dot com. That's the website for the book. B o c h y dot com. Bochiball dot com. Excellent. Well, good. Well, Kevin, thank you very much. We'll look forward to doing it again. Likewise, Andy. Thank you, man. Thank Take you. care. Thank you again, Kevin. That was Kevin Freiberg, co-author with his wife, Jackie, of Bochi Ball, the chemistry of winning and losing in baseball, business, and life. Joining me next, as always at this time, is my friend Bridget Gleason. Bridget is Vice President of Sales at Logs.io. And today, Bridget and I are going to talk about why we in sales and sales leadership we have to be brilliant at the basics. I mean, how we have to strip the unnecessary complexity away from sales and really focus on mastering the basics, those core human skills that enable us to connect with buyers, engage their interest, build their trust, and inspire them to take action. Okay, let's jump into it. Bridget, how are you doing? Andy. Yes. Oh my God, this is the first when we're like live eyeball to eyeball. Eyeball to eyeball. Great. So I love Zoom. Zoom. Yeah, those glasses are are very nice. They make yeah. Make your your eyes make your eyes pop. Okay. Well, I actually I went to the optometrist the other day. I want to get new glasses. And I said, you know what? I want glasses that make me look more serious. And they're like, (laughs) do people not take you seriously? I said, Oh, they do, but I think I want more serious. Like Oh, really? I know, I know. I, I totally, I, I have an interest in having, like, being really badass. I think people are scared of me a tiny, tiny bit anyway, but I'm, I'm okay to just, like, take it up take it up a notch. Yes, you are one of the more intimidating pers- people I know. Uh, Actually, I, know. I, I wish I had the guts to do colored frames. I mean, I'd, Really? Yeah. Yeah, it seems like, I, I know guys, like designers, right? Every time you need a, I have one friend, who, I know, past client is a industrial designer cool guy every time i see him he's got a different color frame it's like damn he looked that looks cool on him it's a, probably looked really horrible on me but <laughs> well there's um a, a woman who works in our tel aviv office who's in product and she has the most amazing glasses and so she took me one day to get these really unusual frames she's very yeah. artsy. she can really pull it off okay i put them on and I'm not kidding. I look like a clown. Like this, <laughs> it doesn't come to look. It looks like okay. She looks stupid. So I color a little color on a traditional frame is this most. But I'm I'm going to go back to like stark and 
serious and the intimidating of intimidating. Yes. So we'll have to promote you from Captain Fantastic to like Colonel or something that's a little more intimidating. Do you know one of my CEOs, he used to say that I was a Martinet. You? Yeah. That yeah. I'm like and I I I wear that like a badge. <laughs> I don't like it. I think for for anybody who's listened to us over was now, this is our hundred and fortieth conversation oh. together. I don't think they would have that impression of you. That I'm a Martinet? Yeah. That's because I've never bossed you around. Like, you haven't been on any of my sales teams. <laughs> they may say, you should ask them. I don't know that they would say I'm a Martinet, but I think they know. Like, I'm easygoing, easygoing until I'm not. Sure. And when I'm not, don't cross me. Yeah. And it's Well, you've earned that to some degree. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've, I've grown into it. Well, that could be too. Yeah, right? As we get older, we get a little more crotchety. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I know. I it's know. Like, it's like, yeah, remember my last dog was, you know, reached a certain age. Yeah, it was fun loving until then. And then suddenly, yeah, he had, he had this strict limit, right? I'm fun loving till this point. And at that point, I'm done. <laughs> and that was I, it. I get, I get the analogy. I'm like an old dog. I got no, it. I didn't mean to say that. Oh my goodness! No, 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 Andy. You know I don't care. Like I don't, I don't. I, I accept all of it. I embrace all of it. Good. I good, embrace good, good. all. Good, good, I good. So um, today, so, today, yeah, today. Enough about how we look. No, I, I will add to the glasses stories. I did as you did when my wife and I were in Paris a couple of years ago. Went into a <laughs> a glasses shop bought this really cool pair of, of frames. Yeah. A few months later, I went to get the prescription filled. I was like, oh yeah, this is not me at all. It looked, I, I looked real, looked, if I was living in Paris, I think it would have been me. But once it came back to the States, I looked at them, it's like, oh, why did I do that? Anyway, okay. I know. I know. I know. That's what happens when you travel. I do that too. I'll sometimes buy like an article of clothing when I'm there and I come back and it's like, what was I thinking? I need a costume. I'm not wearing a costume <laughs> up and down the street. Well, that's because we're visualizing ourselves living in that place, right? I know. So it's a good thing. It's a that's good Paris. That's Parisian. Yeah. Going. Yeah. No. Whatever. Whatever. Okay. So here's a question for you. Let's, All talk, right. about, let's talk about sales a little bit here before we, <laughs> before we end the episode. I'm on it. So do we make sales too complicated? I, th- I think we make it too complicated. Like how? Like how? Like, why do you ask that question? What, what leads to that question? That do we make it too complicated? Because I think it's oftentimes we spend too much time talking about everything but the customer. You know, the person sitting on the other side of the table or the desk that we're, we're trying to do business with. And, and as I spend more and more time in sales, you know, now spanning... A really don't long time. Say it. Don't say it. Don't say it. You don't need to give up that information. <laughs> is that what I find is actually what's increasingly is, is what's more effective is, is what's more simple, you know, more direct. Um, that you know, if you spend more time focusing on that person and the person across the table and across the, the desk who you know, you're trying to do business with, that, that and really – yeah, reduce it to its sort of most simple, basic elements that your odds of success go up, and that that we sort of encumber sales with with too much these days. And uh, I started thinking about this because what sort of triggered the thought is and I re- written about this a couple weeks ago. Is is after the um, unfortunate passing of of Anthony Bourdain, who I was a big fan of his work, um, and and I thought that his talent was that he always he was able to find the story in another person and to me that really translates into sales right is our job is really with the buyers to really find out and learn their story you know what 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 they're trying to achieve what their objectives are what their goals are you know what the relative importance of various things are to them to really understand them and i think with the trappings of a lot of the processes and methodologies that they get implemented, we lose sight of that. Here's my theory on that. 
is uh, one of my, he's actually an enterprise, a super talented guy. He always talks about being brilliant at the basics. You got to be brilliant at the basics at sales because it's all basic. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's, it's the basic thing that you're talking about. But I think, I don't know that we train people well enough on the basics. And so we've got all these proxies. It seems like we've got these proxies that we're trying to put these guardrails. So just stay within these guardrails. Mm-hmm. And we over it. And I think right. that makes it more complicated. Oh, I agree. We're, we're trying to like do all these things either to automate or script or a tool and then do this and then do. And I think as people are kind of going through it somewhat robotically, they're not thinking. And I think they lose out on, on how to be brilliant at the basics, how to be just great at the basic things that have to do with understanding what a customer is trying to achieve and figuring out if you've mm-hmm. got a way yeah, I've, I've I've always felt throughout my entire career that's that's been my superpower, quote unquote, in sales are the basics. And as you know, through all the various acronyms and so on, I've created they're all about the basics. But I, I was thinking about this again back in the context of the Bourdain thing because again, I'd read his obituary and it had a link to an article that actually I'd, I'd clipped a quote from years and years ago, uh, and it called to mind this this quote and. And I thought you know, it was really relevant to sales. Let me just read it real quickly here. Is, is somebody asked him about you know the secret to why his shows are so popular, and he and he said, "quote What I do is not complicated. Any stranger who shows an honest curiosity about what the locals think is the best food is going to be welcome. When you eat their food and you seem happy, people sitting around a table open up, and interesting things happen." And I thought, That's great, right? And I thought. This is sales. Yeah, we just have to show up and be interested and authentically interested in the other person. So it's really interesting. And Andy, they open up. I um, interviewed somebody uh, last week for a sales role here. And one of the things I liked about him, just curious. You could tell he was asking questions, not like, Okay, let me give you my list of questions. Mm -hmm. Number one, what is the... It was just this conversation where he was genuinely curious about a lot of things, about different ways that our product worked. And our our CEO talked to him also. And after I'd said, what did you think of this candidate? He said, I liked him, but he didn't talk. He said, I'm used to sales reps talking about... You know, I'm always 126% quota <laughs> and then I sell deals and I bring in the big. And so he said, I'm not really sure. I said, you've been so trained poorly. Yeah. That's what we want. And I said to him, don't we want more than anything? A human being. A human who's going to be curious and he understands and he's, and I talked to two of his reference today and that's why he was successful. Mm-hmm. Just Genuine, per- just the Anthony Bourdain showed up, interested, smart, super smart, and just interested, curious, really has that genuine interest in helping a customer solve a problem. Guess what? He was su- has been really successful. Mm-hmm. Very basic that you're talking about. Yeah. Well, you know, as, as you and I have talked about before, a couple things. One is, you know, I've reduced my four primary lessons of sales to an acronym called BALD, right? Go BALD. My favorites. Be, be human. Ask great questions. Listen slowly. Deliver value. I mean, that's that's the, I call that the, that's the operating system for a relationship, any relationship, whether it's in sales or in life, right? Be human. Be focused. Ask great questions. Listen very slowly. Deliver value. And that's what this person you're talking about clearly did. He wasn't you know, asking you questions based on some scripted list, but he was responding to what you were telling him, and he was he was curious about it. And I think it gets this to me. It gets a, a bit to this issue, and if not a lot to this issue, you and I were sort of talking about before we started recording today about you know we have a role for training, but I think we we misunderstand what training is really for, 
And what, what's missing is educating our sales reps. So we know we need to train them, right? There are certain things people need to be trained on. But you know, I love this, this saying that you know, we train pets, we educate people. And if we want people to get smarter, if we want to get people to get curious, is we need to, it's like you know, sort of the mission we talk about in sending our kids to school. It's, right? We're trying to teach our kids how to think. Well, isn't that what we're really trying to do with, with our sales professionals is help them learn how to think in the moment, think, uh, think it, critically, and, right. and you don't train that. You help people, you educate people to do that. You help them get smarter just by exposing them to more things. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's really, really true that sometimes I've worried a bit about, you know, over scripting or being over prescriptive really about anything because am I, am I trying to get, make them dumber or just not think? I want them to think because when you're in a live conversation, you, it's not just, okay, let me go to the next note. It's, listening, like you said, listening slowly mm-hmm. and really trying to understand and then being able to react. But that takes some cognitive, um, cognitive work. You have to, you have to be in it, listening, paying right. attention and be able to think on your feet. And I think that's, that's a lost art. Well, I, th- I think in part because unintentionally, I don't think we're intentionally trying to do that. I think it's just the way things have evolved in sales and with various aspects of our technology is that you know, we are putting more and I'm saying this we globally, not necessarily you and I here uh, sharing the space, is is you see more pressure put on people to conform, right? To a process, to a methodology. And and I was having a conversation yesterday with um, Dave Blanchard, who's been on the show, and Dave is is chairman of the Og Mandino Institute. And people Hopefully, you have read Og Mandino's book, one of the classic. Great classic sales books, The Greatest Salesman in the World. And in the fourth scroll, as Dave reminded me, is you know, Og writes that you know, you really your objective as a salesperson is not to be like any, is to not be like any other salesperson. It's not to be a clone of some other person or what they do, but to be the best version of you possible. And I, I think we lose that. And this is where I get back to this idea of educating people. Is I, is I, I want people to, to be focused on, geez, how do I get you know, 1% smarter every day? And not even necessarily 1% smarter about sales. Just what am I going to learn today? If we just get people back in this habit, I know it's hard once we get out of school and so on, is to get people in this idea of, of learning. But it's just. But do you think it's hard when you're out of school? Well, I think there's so many distractions, right? I mean, it's it's. That's I get distracted with the learning that I want to do. Oh, you do for sure because you're reading all the time, and, and as do I. And in our next episode, we'll talk about our summer reading list. But um, yeah, I think that I think that that it, yeah, it is hard for people to sort of once they get away from school to sort of maintain that habit of reading or you know purposely engaging in content that could be listening to this podcast. I mean, you can look at the podcast audiences or the audiences for all the sales podcasts out here and. I guarantee you they, you know, maybe one percent of the total percent you know, population of salespeople in the world, you know, are listening to podcasts. So it's it's um, it's a challenge, and I, I I think I think companies have to take on this this challenge more so than just leaving it in the hands of the individuals. I think, and you and I have spoken about this before. Is I think I think one of the things that has to change is to the extent that the companies set aside time for training, they have to set aside time for education during during the workday. Oh yeah, and and they don't because it's considered sort of a nice to have, or it'd be great if we got all of our salespeople to go read these books. So it's like give them time during the day. There are companies that do this; they set aside time every business day. Fast growing companies with a lot of loyal employees because they're helping get smarter. Set aside thirty minutes a day to read, and they read collectively. And everybody says, "Oh, we can't do that in sales," and I'm like, "Well, of course you can do it in sales." You know, the research shows that sellers never spend more than 35% of their time actually selling to a prospect. Exactly. No, you can always do it. You and I have talked about that having like, almost like instead of having nap time, having reading time. And <laughs> do you have nap time? Is that what the substitute would be? You could you have nap time at logs.io? I would love to have nap time. Honestly, I would love to have nap time. If I could take a nap every day, 
I'd be a different person. I'd, well, I'd be less edgy. You'd be less I, intimidating. I'd be less. So I would. I wouldn't need dark glasses. Kind of soft. <laughs> well, maybe if you just like started your run an hour later. So instead of starting your run at four thirty every morning, do it at five thirty. No, but see, this goes back to. I think this curiosity for me, it's not even, it's not just learning. It's really curious. Part of the reason I get up so early is I need a good solid hour where I'm reading the New York times. Mm -hmm. Like that's my investigation. That's I'm doing stuff, but we do definitely have a culture here at logs. IO where we're reading, we share podcasts. We talk about it all the time. It's a big topic of conversation. What are you reading? What are you listening to? What are you all, all the way up and down? And I, and I love our CEOs the same way. The VP of marketing or our CMO and I were talking about a book, you know, uh, new sales simplified mm-hmm. Mike Weinberg mm-hmm. and our CMO had read it. And I had the book and I said, yeah, it, it, you know, great book. I did a re- reread. Our CEO said, great. I'm going to read it read it, you know, two days later. Mm-hmm. So we, we definitely have a culture of that. And also listening to podcasts. Somebody said to me today, Oh, Bridget. So I heard on your podcast the other day, you were talking about, and I'm like, what did I say? <laughs> but, but we just, we have that as a, we, that's very much what we do. And yeah. what we talk about. Well, I think, we're, but I think the step that companies have to take those, they have to institutionalize it. This is, this is part of what we do. If we spend, yeah, you know, ten minutes or fifteen minutes in every sales meeting doing training. Hey, these hours during the week, we're gonna block out. This is time for people to edu- get educated, and maybe it's you know it's it's concerted. You have book lists. I've done this with clients. I've given them you know lists of books we've worked through over the course of an entire year. Ten books uh, where we come in and then you know they read it, and then every month I come in and because they're reading one a month basically, and I come in and do a virtually come in like this and do a uh, lead a book discussion. Uh, and they discuss it every week in their their sales meeting as well. Yeah, people are reading ten more books than they ever read before in, about sales, and yeah, it's been very powerful. Yeah, I, I'm a big believer. Brian Tracy said, you know, if you just read half hour a day, it's fifty books a year. You'll be in the top one percent of producers and earners in your in your field. And I think that's there's a lot of wisdom to that. I don't remember him saying that, but I like it. Yeah, I've got the. I like it because you know what? We like things that we do. So I already do it now. And like that's I, why you're in the top 1%. Like you said, you know, Bridget, what we found was that people who have two shots of vodka a day are just, they sleep better at night. I'd be like, nah, I'm, I'm willing to toss and turn. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I thought, you were, I thought you were signing up for the experiment to, uh, to test that promise. What? The two shots of vodka a day would help you sleep. Oh, God, no, no. That, I don't have any interest. The, the reading. One over your cornflakes in the morning. I know. The reading, you could sign me up all day long. Like, I'd be like, yeah. yes, love it. No, well, we were always the, the geeks, the little family when we were growing up. You know, I'm one of seven kids. We go to the library. We, could, we had a limit. We could each only check out seven because yeah, whole shelves, whole shelves would be empty. No, I know, and then because my mom's having to keep track because she had books too, and my father had books. Yeah, and they don't didn't have limits, but we could only get seven, and we went every week, and it would be like oh, I remember those days, precious, like oh my god, I only get seven, you know, and I'm going to rip through these quickly. That was going to the library. That was a big day for us. That was. Oh yeah, no, I I loved going to the public library when I, I was a kid. You what? I still love the library. Ah, yeah, I can't try to remember the last time I went. I mean, I, I'm bad. I just I buy books that I want to read, but because um, so easy. But I, but I, you can also I just like libraries, but yeah. you can also, like on Kindle, you can rent them from the library. Oh, true, um, true. So I do that as well. Hmm. I'm not sure. I know where the. I'll have to look it up where the local library is here in Manhattan. Um, I there is one. I know that I I know where the public library is. That's I'm talking the my. I'm talking about my local where I live. I'm not going to go all the way to the pub, the beautiful public library, which I've been in. It's I've beautiful. Been, it's beautiful. I've I've sat and read in it. 
on my my Kindle. But um, yeah, yeah. Well, okay, I'll check that. It's on my on my list. But surprisingly, you know, cities I saw. Where was I? Somebody recently somewhere in San Diego where they're building a new public library. You know, it's like wow, they're still building them. That's so cool. That is kind of amazing. Well, I think that companies have to build libraries, right? That that I said I, I before. I just want to wrap up on that that topic is is and you were talking you and again you and I were talking about this a little bit earlier is that you know we talk about enablement in sales you know we talk about content training coaching you know I think there's a a fourth leg to the stool that's really missing which is education you know the training's not a, a substitute for helping people get smarter it's a way to train people to do certain repetitive rote tasks but that's not education that's not helping people get get smarter doesn't mean we don't need training we do in certain areas but we're not helping people with the underlying understand the basics, right? You know, you met you met somebody who learned or intuitively understood this idea about being curious and building relationships and the importance and how to sort of structure that. You can educate people about that. People can learn about how to do that. You know, people can learn how to develop their own their own methodology, if you will, about sales. That you did, I did, certainly, even though we were trained by large and corporations. Also. Pardon? And we were trained. And we were trained. But, right. But I think the way we, we got smarter, though, was not through the training. It was through, it was through basically mentorship and, and apprenticeship, right? And that's, that seems to be an element of sales that, that certain, in certain sectors, and I think tech is one of those, where you know, we're obsessed with this idea of onboarding people very quickly and getting them up to speed as we don't sort of invest in this this apprenticeship that enables people to really learn from their peers in a way that I think would make them, if given that latitude, make them more productive after the first year perhaps than forcing them through this this onboarding program or exclusively this onboarding program uh, that they go through now. I think they yeah. miss, you know, they miss some of the just observation. I need I need time to sit and observe. How did apprentices learn how to you know, become silversmiths or whatever in the olden days. I mean, it was, yeah, through doing and repetitive doing, but also by a lot of watching. Yeah, that's, that's definitely, definitely true. Okay. Well, good. That sounds like an end. <laughs> sounds like an end. I think we're, I'm just looking at the time and seeing that it is coming to the end. All right. All right. Well, that's good. Well, we're going to cut this one short because Bridget's got end of quarter deadlines. She needs to go make her number which we will count on it. Or there will be hell to pay, as she said. She'll well, be there uh, intimidating people into. You, I, no, I, I think I've said that the do you, board. Do you, make, do you make your salespeople cry? No. Okay. Have you? No. Okay. So you're not that intimidating. No, they shake in their boots, but they don't cry. No, I'm not. No, I think they were scared. Like, I'm not, I'm not mean. No. So it's it's not a character assault. I think we cry when we feel like it's a care a, a, an assault on one's character. Yeah. That's what. I cry. But when it's just um, well, in case uh, you can't uh, tell, you know, Bridget's, Bridget's sitting at a desk. She's six five. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, you just can't tell. That's right. She looms That's over right. people when she speaks to them. Right. All right, Bridget. Well, this is great for our first. Uh, I know. For those and, who are watching this, I suppose to just listening on our podcast uh, and we welcome people in either way, but uh, it's been great. Great to see you. And great to see you and looking we'll, forward to next week. We'll look forward to seeing you next week and friends. We'll look forward. Even if we can't see you, we look forward to uh, having you here with us next week. Sounds great. Have a great one. Bye. Okay, friends, that was Accelerate for the week. First of all, I want to thank you for joining me and I want to thank my guest, Kevin Freiberg and my friend, Bridget, Bridget Gleason. Uh, join me again next week as I'm joined by my guest, Brad Owens. Brad is the self-proclaimed Robin Hood of hiring. He's a small business recruiting and hiring expert. He's also the host of the Small Business Hiring Podcast. And we have a great talk about all the aspects of hiring that too many companies don't pay attention to, which is basically how to recruit, I mean, how to attract the candidates that you need in your business. And of course, no accelerator would be complete without swapping stories with Bridget. As always, she'll be joining me for our weekly conversation. Be sure to join us then. So thanks again to our sponsor, Discover Org, for their ongoing support of Accelerate. Thank you again for joining me and for listening to the show. And until next week, good selling, everyone.